You ever notice how I have a lot of gear in this studio? Maybe you haven't, but if you look in the background here, you see amplifiers. Some people actually think this is a green screen back here. These amps, the guitars, the pedals. Why do I have all this stuff? Why do I have all these Les Pauls? Aren't they all the same? Well, actually, they're not all the same. This guitar, for example, is really cool looking. No, I'm just kidding. This is a Les Paul Custom. And it has a very different sound from this. This is a Les Paul gold top, but with P90 pickups. The pickups sound completely different. If I take this guitar out, this is an old Les Paul Deluxe, and this has mini humbuckers. As you can see, these are about half the size of a regular humbucker. And it sounds in between a single coil and a full-size humbucker. Okay, so why do you need all this stuff? Why do you need all these amplifiers? Some people use the term tone chaser. A tone chaser is somebody that's always looking for a sound. I think of Jimmy Page. I think of Jimi Hendrix or David Gilmore or Eric Johnson. When I think of tone chasers, people that are always experimenting, trying to find that sound that they hear in their head. Trey Anastasio, when I worked with Trey years ago, he would be very particular about his sounds. But really that goes for every famous musician, especially guitar players. Brian May. Brian May sounds completely different from David Gilmour and Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton. As a matter of fact, they all sound different from one another. Why is that? Well, besides their, they have different brains and different hands, they use different gear. Brian May's guitar is totally different than Jimmy Page, his 59 Les Paul. And they use different amplifiers, and they use different effects. As a matter of fact, one of the things that they did was go out and search for their own sound. When I hear Eric Johnson, I hear that violin tone that he has in his single note solos. It really only sounds like Eric Johnson. It's not just the content of what he plays. He has a really original sound or tone. Same thing with his clean guitar sounds. When I hear any of these guitar players I've been talking about, their rhythm tones, their lead tones, I instantly know it's them. It's not just what they play, it's their sounds. Now, you could say, well, can't you just get these same sounds out of digital gear? And I say, well, you can get different sounds out of digital gear, but essentially, when you're using some type of modeling device, you're basically using the same algorithms as everyone else. You're using the same amplifier algorithms, the same speaker simulators, same mics that are on them. You know, you might have different impulse responses, but essentially everybody's using the same stuff, the same effects. The thing with analog sounds, using real amplifiers, for example, if you want to say that's analog, is that they have a different sound every time you turn them on. Let's take a listen to some famous musicians and hear what I'm talking about by this variety of tone.
none of these players could be mistaken for another, whether it's Jimi Hendrix's fuzz tone or Tom Morello's scratching that he's doing or Pat Metheny on acoustic guitar. His tone is all in his hands in that clip. So I started making the video here and then Rat and Dilly showed up and I thought, I'm going to show them the beginning of this, what I have, and get their opinion on it. So Rhett, I have these clips, Jimi Hendrix, Brian May, Eric Johnson, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you're right. Most great players, at least all of my favorite players, have a unique voice on an instrument, and they don't sound anything like each other. Not even remotely close. It's like they almost speak a completely different language. Or okay, different well, okay, let me stop you with this. Um, let's take a, a person like Brian May. I mean, how many different sounds does Brian May really have? Not many. Not many, right? Yeah. What about Eddie Van Halen? Other than, you know, he's got his flanger, he's got his, his phase 90, Three. he's got his echo. I mean, he yeah. only has a few different yeah. sounds, really. Right. I mean, really different sounds. Eric or Johnson Eric Johnson. Two. His clean I mean, sound and his... His violin sound, the fuzz, fuzz bass yeah. sound. Yeah. Right. So most of the guys have very few tones right. that they use. Derek Trucks plays one amp all night, straight in, one sound. But with guys like that, though, there's a lot that's happening here. Yes. And a lot that's happening here. Funny you should say that because I comment on Neil Schoen's videos. And Neil is always moving his volume knobs and tone knobs and switching pickups. Yeah. And he, he joked, we, you know, I, I commented on his Instagram and he said, you know, a lot of people think that doesn't do anything. But I remember going to see Pat Metheny years ago, back, you know, 40 years ago now, and he just kept turning up the whole gig on his 175. It's like, how much, what was he at, zero or what? <laughs> He's just working his way up He keeps time. turning up. How can he keep turning up? I never see him turn down. The first time I ever heard anybody or saw anybody do that was about... Eight or nine years ago, um, when Joe Bonamassa started getting on YouTube for the first time, he'd pop up on like the Premier Guitar videos, like early in the Premier Guitar YouTube days. And uh, he was the first guitar player that I saw actually talking about that. Like, there is an infinite number of variations, an infinite amount of variations of tone between, you know, if you're on a Les Paul, you know, these two. Uh, you know, your volume and your tone knob or strat or telly or whatever, and he's right. It, especially if you've got a really good amp and a good, uh, you know, maybe if you're playing a fuzz, like a really reactive fuzz or something, that, you know, you back off three or four notches on your oh. volume knob here, it's a completely Radically different, different change. Yeah. When I do my videos on Instagram, I, I almost never, when I play my, my Les Paul special, I'm usually on four mm -hmm. on, my, on my lead pickup for some reason. Right. I don't know. I just back it down to where it feels like it's has the right amount of well, gain. Well, it's probably cutting through a little bit more. You're getting less low mid range and low end from the pickup. Yeah. You're getting less low end information, which especially on a phone is going to yeah. come through better. It's going to come through the microphone and the the, the speaker better. Uh, but I think going back to this idea of sounds, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, with with a lot of these players, is like they figured out early on how to get the sound that was in their head out of their rig and that's part of what makes them so great is we love the way they they sound you know and well it also influences be, beyond their their lead playing their voice because they have a lead voice and many of them have their rhythm voice yeah. and their rhythm voice many times is their lead voice turned down and maybe with a you know some gain pedal up but right most of the guys we're talking about would have very few pedals that they use yeah. right now if you think about the things that modern players use axe effects helix kemper yeah. things like that right or neural dsp when you are playing these things i say in the video that everybody has the same algorithms mm. now i would argue that it's that analysis paralysis right you have so many possibilities that it becomes almost impossible to decide on one thing and say that's my definitive voice whereas when you have an amplifier and you have a a finite amount of pedals let's say you you have one overdrive pedal a delay pedal 
and one modulation pedal, something like that, right? Well, it's an interesting discussion. So I, I'm kind of of two minds about it. I agree with, I use modelers a lot, and I have for a long time. I've had a Kemper from... And I'm not anti-modeler. <laughs> I have them all. Put your pitchforks and torches away. Actually, my first Kemper I bought from you. That's right. Uh, like six or seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had it. It's one of the, I think one of the early ones, yeah, maybe? Yeah, an early rack mount, yeah. yeah. So I've been using them for a while. And the thing is, you're right. When you've got, like the Helix, for example, how many models? And dozens and dozens of amp models. Well, for me, I know what I like. I've spent enough time on, you know, playing real amps, analog amps, and kind of found the sound that I like to get, that I know generally what ballpark I'm going to work in. But even in that, there's, oh, you like an AC30 sound? Where here's four different AC30s, and then here's three different matchlesses, and then here's the divide by 13. Here's 25 JRP. different cabinets yeah, with, here, with or 50 different mic or whatever. <laughs> and it does, in fact, I've been getting to the point where at home, practicing, I just want a little 112 combo that's not crazy yeah. loud, that's tube, that sounds good turned down, that I can sit next to my chair and just sit down, flip it on, plug it in. It's got a little reverb and I can sit and play. And I don't have to flip on the modelers and go through all the menus and all that kind of stuff, which it's really not that difficult, all, all things considered. But on the tone side of it, I think you're right. Everyone is sort of starting with the same baseline. When you compare that to, uh, let's look at Clapton, for example. In London, in the mid '60s, he was buying amps direct from Jim Marshall. Yep. This is the early days of Marshall amplifiers. Each one was totally different. Yeah, they, they used different parts. Whatever they could, whatever get, they could get their hand. The tolerances on the parts were all over the place. Right. You know, when he bought his his blues breaker, you know, he it's because uh, I believe the story is he left his JTM forty five head and cabinet gig, and he needed another another cabinet or another amp he could play and throw in the back of his car so he asked for a JT45 combo and that became the famous blues breaker sound the Beano sound that was completely different than his earlier stuff if he had been using a modeler <laughs> I don't I don't know if he would have found as original a sound maybe you know it's interesting that I think when people use modelers too there's I've noticed this that in the in the past, most people would not use a compressor pedal uh, yeah. for when they were using distortion. That's really a new thing for a lot of the new techniques that people play, uh, that, that people use, left-hand techniques. There's uh, Compression has become a real part of the sound to even out the notes. If you do hammer-ons from nowhere and things like that. Whereas, historically, I never saw people with compressor pedals. Very rarely. Unless it Very was rarely. an effect on its own. Unless yes, you if you're like, doing some type of reggae sound, you yeah. wanted a, a nice compressed, yeah, compressed tone. I'm not a fan of the always-on compression thing. Uh, I get it if that's the sound you're going for, and you're doing a lot of, um, you know, tapping on the fingerboard or something where you need something to even out that dynamic. I totally get it. But to me, the best part of an amp. And to be fair, a lot of the modelers are getting good enough now that they can do this, is the touch sensitivity and the dynamic response of an amplifier completely goes away when you put a compressor That's in right. front of it. Um, it also affects, to me, it affects your feel because rhythmically, the, the dynamic variations between notes are what make things rhythmic. If yeah. I take a style, this is an extreme example, like bebop. Well, bebop, when people play phrases, they typically will accent... Every time a note jumps up in pitch, they always accent the high points of the phrase. Yeah. That would give, that's what gives it its sound, um, are those accents. And if it's compressed, there are no accents. You right. can't hear them. Everything is all the same dynamic level, so it doesn't have any kind of feel with it. Right. And we were talking about players like John Schofield. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons John Schofield's got very dynamic playing. Right. He leaves a lot of space. He, he has really... Uh, what, what is the word? Languid, you know, liquid, uh, like uh, sound with his lines yes, and things. Yes, very and, and fluid. Very fluid, yeah. and that's because of the dynamics that he has in his lines because he's not using a compressor pedal. Right. Well, and, and going back to the modeler thing, there the other side of it is, well, yes, people are starting from the same baseline. It's opening up the possibilities for especially younger guitar players or guitar players that you know are on a budget 
you now have access to every, just about every single type of effect and digital representations of some of the most favorite effects and amps and, and sounds that are out there that you can then start to combine in unique ways. And I've seen a lot of people start to do that, especially in like the, um, the sort of modern neo soul guitar thing that's popping up on Instagram. You know, Paul Jackson Jr. probably wouldn't have used like an octave up effect on his sound playing with Luther Vandross or whoever he was playing with, but I'm seeing that kind of thing happening now a lot on Instagram, and it's pretty cool. It's a pretty unique sort of sound. So I think there's a lot of players out there that are utilizing... I think modelers are great tools, and there's a lot of players out there that are utilizing those tools to create new sort of sounds uh, that weren't... It's not that they weren't possible before, but they were a little bit more difficult to get. Okay, well, I'll, I'm going to say this. So Rhett... When Rhett got here, I said, okay, I'm going to play you some players that you know on Instagram. I'm not going to name any of them. I'll say, tell me if you can recognize them. And they're all people Rhett knew, and he couldn't recognize any of them. Now, why is that? Well, because they don't sound different enough from one, one another. That's why. They use a similar vocabulary, yeah. a lot of the same sounds. Um it's not black and white like when you hear Brian May. I mean, his lead tone sounds nothing like Jimi Hendrix's or, yeah. or Eddie Van Halen's. Just nothing like it. Right. Yeah. Now, if you were going to start with a sound, right? Let's say you had one amplifier and you had three effects, right? Would you start with a distorted amplifier or a clean amplifier? I would start with a clean-ish amplifier. Mm -hmm. I would not go totally flat clean because I, I like a little bit of um, I want the amp to impart some personality and I've found that an amp that's on the edge of breaking up or at least that you're putting into its sweet spot I made a video on this a couple weeks ago uh, that you're putting into its sweet spot that's where it needs to live I like Vox amps for that to me Vox amps are really great with pedals but, you know, historically, people have used things like high watts. My high watt sounds killer with pedals. Uh, my orange, the new Mad Amp that we played through that we'll use in a video here, is a beautiful, clean amp. It has a ton of headroom. It's it's has a beautiful chime to it. Um, but these Voxes have, I, I think, are, are a really good platform. For, for the sounds I like, a really good platform to... to uh, build a tone with pedals. Yeah, well, they've got a good, uh, well, they're, they've got a good even response, I think. I agree. I've used Vox style amps for a long time for that kind of a pedal platform amp. And I think you're right. I, I would pick a Vox circuit, like an AC30, over something like a Tweed Deluxe circuit. Although Tweeds can take pedals really well too. But the other side of that too is like the Fender thing. You look at guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan. He was oftentimes, I mean, he was kind of playing everything, but a lot of his sound is that mid-scooped right. Fender sound, which is why things like Tube Screamers work so well for those guys. Yeah. Because they're bringing back that mid-range that the amp is naturally lacking, especially playing with a Stratocaster. You're lacking a lot of that mid-range. So it's, it's really fascinating. I think Stevie's another good example of a player that has such a unique sound you, and there's a lot of people that try and get close to that, but they never quite do, and it ends up sounding like they're just trying to... Okay, so getting Stevie. back to what I said at the beginning of the video, why do I have all these things? Why do I have all these amps? Well, one of the reasons that I have them is because I don't want to have to put a pedal in front of an amp. If I'm going to put a pedal in front of an amp that's a high-gain amp, for example, and I'm doing something that's metal or heavy rock, something, whatever it might be, I'll put a pedal to uh, take some of the, to high pass it before it goes into the amp. Maybe I'll put a distortion pedal on with just a little bit of gain, but it'll high pass the guitar, especially with low tune guitars, and just tightens up the sound. Right. Now, now there's pedals that do that, you know, that will high pass it. But I like to take, I like to get the sound as close as I can get just with the amplifier. And my thing was that, when I was making records all the time, when I put a pedal in front of something, it ends up taking the personality to me away from the amp many times. Mm -hmm. And if I could get that amp tone to be where I want it to be, really close to what the amp naturally sounds like, 
I always felt like I got a lot more harmonic information on tape or in Pro Tools. Well, is Eric Johnson taking the personality away from one of his plexis when he puts a fuzz face in front of it? No, because that is about that sound. Right. So that's the other side to this. It's yeah. Like, yeah, if you put, you know, let's say, uh, you know, whatever, a... a an EQ or a boost or a tube screamer. I'll say you just put a tube screamer in front of a Marshall. It's like, yeah, that's going to change the sound of the Marshall. And if you were going for that Marshall sound, that's not, that may or may not accomplish what you're looking for. But guys like Eric Johnson figured out, I guess, early on through experimentation and trying stuff that, man, this, this, this is personally why I love effects and I love messing around with sounds and, and sort of the craft of making sounds is because the sound that's coming out of your rig directly informs your playing. Totally. You're inspired by the sound. That's it. That's everything. It's everything. Honestly, if you have a bad sound, if I have a bad sound, I can't play. Now, there's a few people that can play even if their sound isn't good. When I went to NAM, when we were at NAM, and I yeah. saw Frank Gambale play at the Kiesel booth, he played through some strange amp he'd never played through. He had some backing track playing, but he didn't care. He just played through the amp yeah. and he sounded phenomenal. <laughs> Like, Frank, it doesn't matter to you. You're so good. Yeah, it's because he's a, a monster player. I mean, it didn't even matter. It's not his sound or anything. It just He just sounded great. He was just grooving. And, <laughs> and it was like, ah. But, yeah. I mean, what? Let, just pick three pedals. What are they going to be? For me, uh, some kind of fuzz, probably an octave fuzz of some type. Um, a delay, a really good delay. If you had to pick one, what would you say that this week? Oof. The uh, delay would be the Strymon Volante. Um, Good choice. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, so, and then in between, so the fuzz would be first, the delay would be last. In between, I'd probably do a, uh, a tremolo. Because I love what the tremolo, a good, like, harmonic tremolo, to be more specific. Um, guys like Joey Landreth. I think are good modern examples of, of players that use a harmonic tremolo as a texture. And it, it, direct, it, it changes the way you play when you've got that sort of... Because a harmonic tremolo is different than like an octave tremolo or a bias tremolo. It's, it's, it's shifting the pitch of the amp, of your, of your sound through the amplifier. And it's a, it makes the amp feel more... Um, it's hard to say. I almost bought an a, a old Fender the other day just because of the harmonic tremolo it completely changes how the amp feels which then changes how you play and what you play and i i love that so i yeah i go octave fuzz harmonic tremolo and delay if i had to choose i mean i would probably take some of my vintage pedals my old memory man pedal um my old MXR flanger that I got, which was my first pedal I ever got in 1978, but it's really noisy. But when it worked, it can sound like a Leslie. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it really can do that sound. And I'd probably take some type of a gain pedal. I like I like fuzz pedals, um, but I might take a gain pedal. Real, I mean, for me, it depends on what kind of amp I'm playing through. Um, because I, I also like, for modulation effect, I like things like, um, you know, uh, phase shifters, phase 90, mm. something like that, or maybe a Univibe, something Ooh, like that. Ooh, Univibe, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Univibe. I find it with some harmonic tremolos, you can get into Univibe territory if you slow them down enough. Because uh, they're not that different from one another. The thing with fuzz, though, the reason I would choose a fuzz over an overdrive, I think, not all fuzzes, there's some fuzzes that are so out there and, and yeah. wild that they're kind of a specific character effect. But a lot of, like a fuzz face, for example, is one of the most versatile pedals and sound. You can get an amazing clean sound. If you want a clean sound that'll cut through a mix, turn on something like a fuzz face and back Yeah, back your, your volume, volume down. That's the thing with fuzz that people don't realize that fuzz pedals are great when you back your volume down. I mean, so much of this stuff is dependent on your volume control. People do not use their volume controls on their instruments, and that's why they're there. Volume and tone controls, pickup selectors, things like that. You know, if you just, if your natural inclination is to go right on 10 with your lead pickup, your rhythm pickup, <laughs> you're, you're missing out on some really cool sounds, I think. I think the guitars just react better once you start backing those things. Find that sweet spot. 
or keep changing it during right. your solo or during your rhythm playing. Right. You know? Or and just change your play. Because the sim- you can get a similar effect. Tim Pierce talks about this. Turn your amp way up yep. to its sweet spot and then just barely touch the strings. Yep. Just play soft and see what happens. It's like this natural sort of bloom. These beautiful, huge sounding notes come through that don't happen when you play hard because the amp you're you're clipping the preamp section and maybe the power amp section depending on how hard you're pushing it and the amp is naturally compressing and you're losing you're hitting that ceiling you know play play softer or play harder or do both ride that and the, a lot of these things that uh, going back to the compression pedals backing off your volume makes very little um difference in in your actual and you being able to do that and changing your tone. Well, that's because the compressor is doing its job of right. compressing, <laughs> elite, like evening everything out. One thing though on the modelers that I really like to do, and I do this on pretty much everything that I like the Helix. This works incredibly well on um, putting a compressor as the very last thing in the signal chain before it goes out of the modeler. I find and I'm it, it's just a very light compression, you know, a light ratio, three to one, maybe. But you're essentially kind of... A light ratio is 1.5 to one, but that's okay. okay. Well, uh, I would I would say three to one, but, you know, <laughs> tomato, tomato. But what I found is it's sort of emulating, uh, like, what you would get in a studio, like a mic'd guitar sound in a sure. studio. If you're running through, you know, a, a Neve 1073 and then into an 1176, you can kind of emulate that sort of response. Because that's the thing with modelers. A modeler, to my mind, is not necessarily going after you sitting in front of your amplifier playing. It's going after the sound of the amp mic'd up in a studio situation and getting that kind of sound. Or right. in a live situation. That's the whole purpose of it. Exactly. It takes that, out, that takes that part out of it. Actually, or it adds that to it. It's part of the sound is the mic the mics being on the cabinet. So I've gotten really good results with modelers making them feel more real by treating them like you would in a studio situation. Put a compressor as the last thing in line. Put an EQ right before your compressor and, and you know you can you can dial out weird frequencies that are coming out or add weird frequencies if that's the sound you're going for. A lot of like that Brian May stuff. There's a lot of strange mid-range sort of well it's all mid-range. It's it's like a half cocked wah that 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 gives them that exactly. that sound. And you which can, is it? You can kind of pull that off with an EQ. Yeah, if you're totally. If you're boosting the right stuff, you know. Yeah, it's things like that that you might not think of. Buy an EQ pedal. You know, put an EQ in line with your stuff and see what you can do with that. You know, it's a lot to do. We'd like to know your thoughts. Leave in the comments what you think, what your solution to this is, what pedals you have, what amps you have, or if you use modelers. Really like to know. I'm actually. You know, really curious to see what people are using today that follow this channel. Thanks, Rhett. Thanks for having me, man. That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're a first-time viewer, ring the bell. That'll let you know when I go live and when a new video comes out. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. That's very important. If you're interested in the Beato book, go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. Follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1. Check out the new Beato Ear Training Program at beatoeartraining.com. And if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks for watching.